Namaskar and a very warm welcome to all present here today. We have reached the last session of the lecture series Kaleidoscope 3. It was indeed a very enriching experience listening to the wonderful lectures on cancer biology, computational biology, and genomics. In this last session, we have Dr. Rini Shah, who will be talking about chromosomal folding. It is an apt topic to be discussed after the morning session on DNA looping and editing by Dr. Arpi. Before I introduce Dr. Rini, a few reminders to the viewers. Please keep your microphone mute and webcam off during the session. Post your question in the chat box. We will be taking it up after the lecture. Please do not leave the session in between the talk. Feedback link will be posted in the chat box of Google Me and description box of YouTube soon. Please fill in the feedback form to avail your certificate. The link will be active only till midnight. Now coming to introducing today's speaker, Dr. Rini Shah. Ma'am has humbly sent a very brief introduction of herself, which I'm sure would not justify her credential. Dr. Rini did her PhD with Professor Sanjeev Galante at Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, ISA Pune, where she worked on understanding the mechanism regulating X chromosome inactivation. Then she moved on to the lab of Professor Frederick Ault at the Boston Children's Hospital, Harvard Medical School to pursue her postdoctoral research where she is trying to understand the mechanisms leading to antibody diversity and maturation. She continues to be fascinated by the remarkable ways in which the chromosome fold and DNA is packaged to fit in a tiny nuclear space and yet maintain the functionality of genome in extraordinary manner. With this, I welcome and invite Dr. Rini to deliver her lecture titled The Art of Chromosomal Folding. Over to you, ma'am. Ma'am, can you um, unmute yourself? You have muted yourself. Yeah. Uh, I was just saying thank you for the kind words. Uh, uh, it, I, I look forward to the session. It's been a pleasure to speak here today. Uh, you can share your screen. Yeah, I'm trying. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, can everyone hear me all right? Yes, yes, it's fine. Uh, okay, so first of all, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the organizers. It's it's a great effort to put up all the seminar series and the topics were really very interesting. Uh, and it's I, I understand it takes a lot of tasks and a lot of efforts in uh, planning all of this. And it's 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 great what you guys have done. This has, these are the things which actually keep us going uh, in such difficult times. And it's wonderful uh, to be able to talk to the students today and with the faculties. And I look forward to a very uh, uh, effective session. Uh, and the reason, uh, I will also give you a reason why I chose uh, this particular topic today. So the other three topics were, uh, were very interesting. They were all uh, based on a lot. Most of it was on application-based science. And I also wanted to give, give a feel to the students that uh, while application-based science is very important, it's also important to conduct basic research because uh, biology is just so wonderful. And of course, you, uh, for you to be able to conduct any therapeutics or any application, you need to first understand the basics. So I thought that's what I'll do today. And all of this basically can be, uh, it's, it's basically underlying to what we, what you guys have heard over the past two or three days, uh, be it cancer stem cells, or be it uh, cancer genomics uh, or gene editing. So yeah, this is basically an underlying principle, which, because it's related to DNA, so basically it governs everything. And another reason also I wanted to uh, uh, talk about this topic today is 
a lot of our understanding about DNA packaging and genome folding is uh, in the textbook is now a little outdated, and it will become clear in my talk why uh, some of those textbooks need to be rewritten, and I'm sure this is going to happen sooner than later. Uh, so with that, I would like to start my talk, and I would like to point here, this is actually a nucleus artwork created by a very uh, uh, good molecular biologist and artist called David Goodsell. Uh, and this is drawn to scale. So this is nucleus. You can see how crowded that is. What you see here is actually the DNA wrapped around the nucleosome. And I will talk about this in my, uh, in my presentation. And what he's tried to draw here is the DNA replication, that's ongoing DNA replication lagging in the leading strands that uh, despite being packaged so intricately, the DNA replication is able to happen. So yeah, so this is this correctly describes uh, uh, how the DNA is packaged. And now we'll try to basically unfold into the talk to understand how the DNA folds. Uh, so the goal of my uh, talk today is to uh, give you a very broad perspective of three things. What is genome folding? How is it achieved and why is it important? So I'll be I'll be talking very basics of the uh, of all of this and also will uh, present uh, a lot of new findings that have come up and also some technologies. Uh, I'll try to address uh, some technical parts as well. And it's important because uh, a lot of students, uh, this is now a very active area of research. And uh, when the students are trying to read a paper and they come across such techniques and such methods, it sometimes becomes very difficult to understand. It's, it's just uh, uh, so unprecedented with all the sequencing and everything. So I thought I will also spend some time on that so that they can also understand the papers when they are uh, trying to learn more about genome folding. So I'll just give a very broad perspective, just enough to get you intrigued into the subject. Uh, yeah. So the first things first, uh, the first problem that we have is to fit the DNA in nuclear space. And when we imagine DNA in nuclear space, uh, this is the image that comes to our mind. Uh, so these are the chromosomes. Uh, however, the chromosomes are not present in this kind of a state in the nucleus. So uh, this this X-shaped chromosomes occur, occur on, uh, they appear only during the metaphase uh, stage of the cell cycle. So this is not how the DNA is packaged into the uh, cells. The way the DNA uh, is present in the cell is in, in this sort of a way. Although it might look, it's very tangly and it's messy, but it's not. It's basically not like this. It's actually more like this. So there are different chromosomes occupying different territories in the nucleus, and I will come to that uh, in the later part of my talk. So the big problem that we have is the total length of DNA double helix when it is stretched end to end is around two meters. And the size of the nucleus that we have is around just 10 microns. So it has to achieve like five orders of magnitude of compaction to be able to fit into this tiny nuclear space and yet maintain all the functionality in terms of DNA repair, replication, transcription, other processes, everything. So how is that achieved? Uh, unlike circuit in uh, Munabai MBBS, when he was asked to find a body for Munabai, he was able to find uh, this particular bag uh, where he could fit the body in and deliver it. But when the scientists, when they sequence the human genome, uh, they could not figure out how to fold it because it's two meter large and the size of the nucleus is only 10 micrometers. So it's been around two decades now since the uh, human genome project was completed. Uh, so we have known the human genome sequence for a very long time and now we know the sequence from a lot of other organisms. And although I'm going to talk mostly about uh, how the human genome is packaged, but a lot of these principles are universal, universal in the sense uh, uh, earthly speaking, uh, uh, you, you'll find uh, similar sort of mechanisms happening even in virus and bacteria in different ways because some proteins might be present only in the humans and not in the bacteria, but the, the, the design principles are very, very alike. So with this problem of fitting the DNA nuclear space, let's go to the textbook model of uh, DNA packaging, uh, which is what is shown here. So this DNA double helix is first wrapped around the nucleus 
uh, which are formed by the histones, and I'll come to it. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a little about it in the next slide. Uh, it is also seen by the electron micrograph. So this is a 10 nanometer structure, as it is called. This is further packaged to give a 30 nanometer fiber, which is also seen uh, by electron microscopy, which is then further packaged by the action of many other proteins uh, uh, to give this kind of a loop domain kind of a structure and achieve further compaction. And this is what has recently been discovered, uh, this loop domain so using microscopy. So this is the loop that you see. And then further compaction, finally giving rise to this kind of a chromosome that we, uh, uh, chromosome as we know it. Uh, here, I will also like to uh, say a word of caution. Uh, this particular structure, 30 nanometer fiber, though we study in textbooks and we have been studying that for ages, uh, this is under a lot of controversy right now. Uh, so people think that this is just an artifact uh, uh, created due to sample preparation for electron microscopy. And when people try to do other sort of methods, use other sort of methods to see the structure in actual nucleus using, say, cryo EM and other methods, they were not able to detect any uh, 30 nanometer fiber. They were able to detect uh, structures ranging from 5 nanometer to 20, 24 nanometer. But something looked like this. So though we study this, but yeah, uh, uh, this is something which needs to be rewritten or only if people will do more research, probably uh, this particular structure will be out of the textbooks. So now talking about the histones, histones are a very basic protein. So, so they, are very, they are positively charged. And because of that, they can efficiently associate with DNA, which is negatively charged. So the core histones are H3, H4, H2A, and H2B. Now, H3 and H4, they form heterodimer, and H2A and H2B, they also form a heterodimer. And now these dimers of these heterodimers basically combine together to form this histone octomer. Okay. So this is the core histone octomer uh, around which DNA is wrapped. Uh, so the size of the DNA that can wrap around the core uh, histone octomer is uh, 147 base pairs, which gives rise to a mononucleosome. And you can have multiple substructures which leads on a string nucleosome array uh, to give this kind of a compaction. This intervening DNA region is not uh, naked. It's also uh, bound by another nucleosome, which is called a linker histone for H1. So uh, the discovery of histones and understanding how the nucleosome uh, or nucleosomes are formed basically opened an entire new field of uh, research called the epigenetics. So epigenetics is something which is beyond DNA. Beyond the genetic code, so uh, it is governed by histone, and histones also have code. So the DNA which is bound to the histones is actually called chromatin. Now, these histones they have their N-terminal tails, uh, which are decorated with multiple histone modif multiple modifications such as acetylation, methylation, or ubiquitination on all different sides. And depending upon the permutations and combinations of this modification, so uh, a, a, a gene can either uh, be activated or be repressed. Uh, a gene can either stay in the center of the nucleus or move towards the periphery of the nucleus. So these combinations of modifications are very important in terms of uh, uh, localization of DNA in the nucleus and also DNA packaging, of course. And uh, the guy who discovered this modification is uh, basically he's ba based at Rockefeller uh, University based in New York. And... Uh, he actually got a Lasker prize for this discovery. Lasker is uh, actually next uh, next best thing to Nobel people say. So a lot of people who win Lasker end up winning Nobel as well. Yeah. Now this histone code is also important because all the cells in our uh, body have same same genetic material. The DNA sequence is the same, but we are still able to have different cell types which govern which 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 uh, perform different functions and that is majorly governed by the epigenetic modifications so depending on what kind of modifications uh, the dna uh, uh, has it will get, it can either form a black cell or a nerve cell or cardiac cells and maintain that and carry out the function of those particular cell types so stem cells are alike but the epigenetics would govern 
what different cell types are formed and uh, how, are, how, how do they function. Uh, with this brief introduction about histone code and epigenetics, I'm not going to spend too much time on epigenetics uh, uh, because I'm sure that's something that's a subject which also uh, which also, which is also being taught in uh, colleges or uh, to undergrads as well as masters students. Uh, I'll now uh, jump to nuclear architecture, but sorry, before I do that, I forgot to mention uh, that uh, uh, the epigenetic modifications, uh, de depending on what sort of modifications you have on DNA, the DNA can either be euchromatine or heterochromatine. So this is the electron micrograph where you, this white structures, which are lightly stained, are all euchromatine regions, and this densely stained structures are all heterochromatine regions which is mostly located at the nuclear periphery and is transcriptionally inactive. So the euchromatin region is the active region of the genome. So if a gene is in the euchromatin part, it's uh, it's transcriptionally active. And just to give you an idea of what sort of a histone mark it might carry, uh, one of the marks it might have is S3K4 trimethylation, meaning the lysine, uh, histone 3 at lysine 4 position in the, in the tail is uh, modified by ME3, uh, the methylation mark, uh, uh, three, three, uh, trimethylation. And the hypochromatin is in the inactive region of the genome, and the transcription in that part of the genome is off. And what sort of histone mark uh, hypochromatin region might carry, one of them is STK27 trimethylation. So there are other plethora of marks, but I'm not going to bore you with that. Uh, now talking about nuclear architecture. So this is this is how a, a nucleus is shaped. These are the different chromosomal territories, uh, which was shown in my first slide as well. Uh, this brown structure here, or the orange uh, 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 circle here, is the nuclear lamina. And then there is a nuclear envelope. Now, these chromosomal territories are uh, can be further subcategorized into, the, into compartments called A compartment or B compartment. So they, there is... There is a segregation uh, into two different compartments. So the A compartment is the euchromatin compartment, and the B compartment, which is close to the nuclear periphery, uh, is the heterochromatin compartment. Uh, don't worry about this right now. I'll come to uh, this uh, in, a, in a bit. The second uh, segregation that you have is the lamina-associated domains, or LADS. And as the name suggests, the part of the DNA that interacts with the nuclear lamina is called the lamina-associated domains. And this uh, domains are generally uh, transcriptionally inactive. They are very repetitive DNA and transcriptionally inactive. And the third uh, thing that we have are these loop domains, which are also called the topologically associated domains. And I'll spend a lot of time on uh, uh, on on this uh, part of uh, 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 the architecture and how are they shaped, what are the proteins. that shows the chromosomal territories. Uh, the chromosome territories were first identified by Thomas Kremers group uh, based in NIH. And uh, the way this, uh, this was done was uh, uh, you can what you can do is you can denature the DNA. Uh, uh, and now then the DNA is single stranded, you can uh, hybridize uh, complementary probes. So, so anything that uh, has a sequence complementary to the DNA sequence uh, would hybridize to that part. Now, now this and we add with chlorophores any of these other colors that are shown here. So then you can hybridize it and, and wash it in a step. You can basically observe the uh, nucleus under uh, a flood microscope and you see this beautiful consumer territory. And the deployed nucleus, so you can see, for instance, uh, this green color is chromosome 2, uh, which is present uh, the nuclear density on one end. Uh, the second copy of chromosome 2 is also present on the nuclear periphery uh, on the other end, likewise for chromosome 1. So all of these chromosomes have specific destinations, and this is maintained. And even in cancer cells, uh, where there is a lot of aneuploidy, there are a lot of chromosomes which are, uh, the number of chromosomes increase, uh, which creates a lot of uh, issues to the cells, of course. But even then, the chromosomal territories are by and large maintained. Uh, depending on what cancer, cancer types you are talking about. 
Second thing is compartmentalization. And this is a very, very recent discovery, and it's an active area of uh, research. Uh, so what people uh, have shown is DNA can be divided into compartments uh, by phase separation. So phase separation is a physical phenomenon. Basically, when, uh, when uh, say, a DNA is bound by a lot of protein, uh, there are a lot of epigenetic modifications which condenses it, which heterochromatinizes it, it will fall out of the solution and it will have a liquid liquid droplet kind of a structure uh, become very gel like and th that's the property it's an emergent property basically and that's what you call phase separation and they did a very very interesting experiment to actually identify phase separation behavior for the dna so this work was done from the analytical group and what they did here was they took some kind of microfluidic device where they have immobilized dna now this DNA is stained with a uh, with a protein dye. That's why it's green in color. And then you can flow in the protein of your interest. So in their case, they flew uh, they flew the protein called heterochromatic protein one, which is a protein that binds the heterochromatin DNA. Uh, and then you observe uh, observe what happens under the microscope. So basically, uh, what they show what they see is uh, uh, the structures, uh, you can you start seeing a globule formation, and this is like a curtain raising uh, a phenomenon that you see. So basically, the protein is binding to the DNA, it's oligomerizing on the DNA and condensing it further, and which is leading to the phase separation sort of behavior that is what is measured. Okay. Um, Second thing is the laminar associated domains. And um, it's self explanatory the, the part of the DNA that associates with the lamina is the lamina associated domain. And as I said before, uh, these are repetitive uh, DNA regions and which are transcriptionally act, uh, inactive. So it's mostly to homogenize to a DNA. And the last thing, the topologically associated domains. And I'll come to this. Uh, these are basically the loop domains. Is there any problem? Sorry. Uh, actually, there's a little group in the bottom. Can you make it loud? There's some oh. different events. I'll, I'll, I'll use my microphone. Yeah. Do, do you want me to repeat anything? I don't. That is fine. That is fine. Uh, your, your, uh, it's... It's low. Your, can you just increase the, yeah, the volume? Um, not much. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think it's fine. Uh, there's one request. Can you just repeat about the chromosome territory? Yeah. Thank you. Yes, 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 that's better. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so the chromosome territory is basically uh, are when you want to know where, uh, what is the location of a particular chromosome in a nucleus, what you can do is you can use a method called DNA FISH. Okay. So, FISH stands for uh, uh, not the MACHI, but the fluorescent in situ hybridization. So, you can design probes which are complementary to the DNA sequence. Okay. So, since DNA is double stranded, first treatment that you do is you denature the DNA. So now the DNA is single stranded. And then you put in, you throw in your probes. Okay. So uh, probes can be uh, earlier, the probes used to be uh, around 500 base pairs to 1 kb in size, but now the technology has improved much further. So you can have an array of probes uh, which can be uh, marked with any of this fluoroprobe. So you can tag your probes with any of this fluorochromes of your choice. So if I have, if you want to label each chromosome differently, you use different combinations of this fluorochrome. And then once the probe hybridization, hybrid, hybridizes, hybridizes to the DNA, uh, it will, uh, uh, you can observe it under the microscope and uh, you'll be able to see this pretty image. So, so these are the different chromosomes. For instance, shown in green here is the chromosome 2, which is present near the uh, nuclear periphery. And uh, if you look at the second co copy of that same chromosome, it's also 
present in the identical position. So each chromosome has their uh, destination, which is uh, uh, more or less uh, uh, fixed, and we don't really understand how that is predefined. Uh, phase separation is something which can uh, help us understand that, but uh, uh, you have to be careful in terms of uh, addressing, uh, putting all the functionality on phase separation. It's an emergent property, and you cannot explain every function, every property uh, by evoking this behavior. Whereas TADS, which are the topologically associated domains, uh, there's been a lot of work, very recent work actually, uh, on uh, uh, how what what TADS are and uh, what they do and how are they important for genome folding. So I, I'll talk about that in my next slide now. So how are these topologically associated domains formed? So simplistically speaking, there are three step, steps to that. The first step is the loading. So this is the DNA double helix. It is uh, the protein called cohesin is loaded into the DNA. So cohesin basically is the protein which is also important for sister chromatic cohesion uh, during the mitosis, and that's why it is called cohesin. And it's not a single protein; it's actually a complex of multiple proteins. So it's the cohesin complex. So it's also called as loop extrusion factor. Uh, it's it's a ring-like protein. This is loaded onto the DNA with the help of another protein called NIPVL. You don't have to remember the names of proteins. So I just wanted to provide their information and that's why I've added here. So that's the first step that the, uh, the cohesin loads onto the DNA. The second step is translocation. Now the cohesin complex is, has a motor. It's an ATPS motor. So basically it can move on, move on the DNA. It can translocate on the DNA. So when it binds and it starts moving on the DNA, it will start looping out the DNA. So this is what is called as translocation, and it will keep doing that uh, unless it encounters something called as boundary factor, uh, which we can have identified to be another protein called CBCS. So when it identifies a boundary factor, uh, the cohesin component can interact with this, uh, can bind to this protein, CTCF, and it is stabilized here and cannot move further. So it is fixed here, and it cannot move further, and uh, this loop is then maintained. And the third step is the un unloading of cohesin from the DNA by another protein called WAPL. Uh, so, can I interrupt again? So, yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, ma'am, uh, can you speak close to the microphone because um, the volume is still very low. Uh, okay, how about now? Um, it's it's better. It's better. But let me before. change some settings. Yeah, because in the YouTube live stream, people are having a little problem in the volume. Oh, how do you change? I'm, I'm, I'm using the Google Meet for the first time. How, how do you uh, go to the microphone settings here? Uh, if you would... Uh, Can you see it down from here? I don't in Google Meet you cannot increase the volume. No, I already did increase the volume, but I thought maybe there is some issue with the settings of my computer or something I can try to change. Okay. But if you can hear me all right now, I will go ahead. Uh, yeah, it's better now. It's better now. You can continue, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, sorry about that. No, that's okay, no problem. Can you see my slide? Yes, we can see. Okay. Uh, yeah. So we were at the final step. Uh, that uh, uh, third step is the loading, unloading of the cohesin by another protein called WAPL. Uh, now I would like to also mention here that this is biology, so nothing is permanent. This is all very dynamic. All of this happens. Everything has a half life. Uh, even uh, the binding of uh, cohesin to say the boundary element has a half life. So this loop is not a permanent structure. But by and large, it will, uh, on an average, if you take the population of cells, you will still be able to see this kind of a structure. So, but however, this is all very dynamic. And as probably Karthik would have mentioned in his talk about uh, how the gene regulatory networks and uh, 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 they depend on each other and they control each other in terms of activating something or inhibiting something and there's this noise. So this is, this is not a gene regulatory network, so to speak, but this is a very, uh, I, I would say cohesin is like a 
very celebrity protein. It requires a loader, it requires a blocking factor, and it requires an unloader for it to do its job. So it's basically a very controlled and dynamic uh, uh, process. Okay. So how do we know all of this? How do you see the 3D genome architecture? Like in our pit talk, you must have he must have shown some data, uh, and I, I'm sure he must have also spoken about uh, some of the methodologies. So how how the 3D genome architecture can be seen? So the the assay, which is called the chromosome confirmation capture based assays, uh, which were developed by Job Decker's group here, uh, they have actually revolutionized the chromatin biology field, and we understand so much more about it and in 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 greater greater details. So this is uh, just a simple schematic to explain this method. There are many many variations of this method. Okay. I I'm not going to bore you with that. So basically, what you do by uh, in this method is you you take a nucleus. And now nucleus will have all this sort of a structures of the DNA. Uh, you add formaldehyde to the cells. Okay. Now that what that would do is that that would crosslink everything basically. So you are taking a snapshot uh, of the nucleus. So the, the the everything that's there is fixed in time and space. Okay. So this is all fixed. Now what you do is you add uh, you take help of bacteria. So basically you take the restriction enzyme from a bacteria. Uh, 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 type 2 restriction enzyme. So it can either be a four base pair cutter or a six base pair cutter. So because it's, it can either identify a four base pair sequence or a six base pair sequence or even a nine base pair sequence, the probability of those sequences occurring in a human genome, which is vast, is pretty high. So you will be able to fragment this genome. So this, if you, if you observe clo uh, closely, all these regions are now cut. So you throw in the restriction enzyme, which will go in, which is nothing but an endonuclease. So it will go and cleave the DNA. Okay. The next step that you do is just uh, uh, one step that you have to do to repair the DNA and also add the biotin tag. This is for DNA purification in, in the next step, uh, in the last step of the, uh, of, of the protocol. So you, after repairing of the DNA, what you again do is you add uh, another prokary prokaryotic enzyme, not a prokaryotic enzyme, actually a viral enzyme called T4 DNA ligase. So li what ligase would do is uh, when the DNA is cleaved, it will have this staggered fra fragments and whichever regions are close to each other, uh, it will basically act on it and ligate those regions. So now I want to remind you here that those regions need not be close in the linear, this linear space because here we are talking about the 3D architecture. So it can, uh, so this, if, if the ligation is happening here, they can be, this regions can uh, be far away in the, in, in the, in the nuclear space, in, the linear, in terms of linear distance. But when you, when you talk about in terms of 3D, 3D distance, they might still be close together and they would be ligated. So now the DNA is repaired and ligated, you use uh, a strata within a, a protein to pull down, so that will bind to biotin and it will pull down the DNA. And also you shear the DNA because the DNA is huge. You cannot sequence the entire chromosome in one go. So you need to chop it to smaller fragments. And basically then you make uh, uh, sequencing libraries and sequence it and do the uh, bioinformatic analysis. So by using this procedure, you can identify the chromosome territories. Okay. So those were identified microscopically. Now this uh, this is identified from a population of cells uh, uh, by following this sort of a procedure. So shown here are chromosomal territories, and this is how the uh, contact map looks. So this is called a high C contact uh, matrix, uh, where chromosome one will always interact with chromosome one. So the sequence here and the sequence here is the same, and this is the contact frequency. So darker the color, higher the contact frequency. So chromosome one will never interact with chromosome two. So that shows that uh, there are chromosomal territories that are present and which the, there is only intra-chromosomal interactions that happen and inter-chromosomal interactions does not happen that frequently. Second thing that you can find out uh, 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 is the compartments, the A and B compartments. So if you zoom in into any of these chromosomes, uh, you'll be able to see this compartment sort of a structure, which is displayed pattern that you see here. Okay. Now, even the compartments don't interact with each other. They don't mingle with each other. Compartment A will interact with the things with the DNA regions in the compartment A and the compartment B will interact with the regions in the compartment B. So you see there is so much of 
fine patterning here as in it's not a mess of a structure the, the the interface nucleus if you see this is not a mess of a structure it's not entangled it is so finely tuned if you zoom into uh, this further you'll be able to see the topologically associated domains which are shown here and i'll explain how to read this in the next slide and then finally you see this loop to me which are basically sub tags so there are topologically associated domains and within domain the topologically the, the the region within the topologically associated domains will interact with each other and this is of the order it can range from uh, anywhere between 25 kv to up to 300 kv or even uh, up to 1 mb so this is much larger so if as you keep going this is up, this is the largest then this, this is smaller this is further smaller and this is even further smaller so this is a sub tag so how to read this kind of a data so i would just like to give you an example using some of the some of my favorite avengers uh, heroes uh, so this is the typical high c contact matrix basically uh, something that i showed in my last slide so the region here and the region here is the same so they will obviously interact with each other this is a matrix so that is seen as a diagonal so when say hulk interacts with hulk or when captain america interacts with captain america uh, this is what you see is the diagonal in the matrix but now when hulk and captain america interact uh, to say go to war uh, against someone you will start seeing this kind of a dot here so this is a different region of the uh, 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 tad and this is a different region of the tad and they are interacting at this particular point so that is how this data is supposed to be read and you will see a lot of papers now coming up uh, uh, in high impact journals which actually show a lot of this sort of a data and i'll be happy to answer any questions if people have any towards the end of the talk so let's look at this uh, step by step so the first step for tad formation is uh, the the loading where the cohesin loads uh, onto the dna okay so how do we know that cohesin is uh, acquired for this process so uh, simplest thing that one could do is you remove cohesin and see what happens right so you cannot really knock out cohesin because that's lethal so what people have done it's very intelligent what they did was they uh, this is one of the cohesin component called rat21 so they tagged it with a uh, a uh, 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 system which will allow them to degrade the protein so basically you don't have to go into the details of this so uh, when this particular protein is expressed with this particular tag you add a uh, uh, a chemical called auxin okay which is a plant horm hormone what it will do is it will target the degradation of this cohesin component okay so this cohesin complex is a ring like structure when you degrade one of the proteins this is no longer maintained and now see what happens so you use the methodology that i just described and see what happens so when you when 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 the cohesin is degraded you stop seeing all of those loop domain structures that you see and then when you do a recovery so in as low as like 60 minutes you st uh, start seeing back the loops so basically the loops were present you degraded the cohesin the loops uh, the domains uh, the tags were lost and then you do the go to the recovery phase and then you can start seeing the same loop domains again so this this again tells you that this is a very dynamic process and uh, it's very well regulated and uh, and why why do we need to study that because you when you when you, whenever you want to do anything in uh, basic sciences you uh, you always have to project that uh, understanding this is important because uh, uh, that will help us understand diseases Uh, however that should be one of the goals but i don't agree that that should be the only goal here so nevertheless uh, we know that mutations in cohesin components can lead to uh, a many many diseases which are called cohesinopathies and they have a myriad of uh, 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 symptoms uh, in terms of there are developmental deformities uh, there is uh, uh, limb development uh, issues there is a cleft palate uh, uh, uh there is a micro and micro encephaly and there are a lot of other issues so yeah and it is also sometimes lethal depending on what sort of mutations you have and some of the mutations in the cohesin components are also uh have also been shown to be uh, uh important for cancer manifestations 
so yeah it's definitely important but so all this tells you is this one ring is 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 to rule them all right now let's go to the second step which is translocation where the cohesin is bound to the dna and it's moving uh, uh, onto the dna and, and unless it encounters the blocking factor so in order to see this what you do is uh, either you can remove the motor from the cohesin component and uh, those experiments are a little tricky so there's not much advancement there uh, there's one study but there's a lot of issues in that so i'm not presenting that uh, so what others have done is they've removed this blocking factor okay which is the ctcf so again the same sort of experiment you tag ctcf with a, a system so and when you add oxygen the ctcf uh, shown in green here will be degraded so there's no green color here and when you put uh, when you recover when you remove the oxygen again the ctcf will be recovered so this is a very quick way and all of this method allows you to uh, remove protein of your interest within within like 20 minutes to 30 minutes so there are what you are scoring for are actually direct effects and not indirect effects so that's really important here and then again they did high c based analysis the chromosome confirmation confirmation capture based assays and again they see the same thing so these are the loop domains that you see this is from one chromosome uh, that i'm showing that's the chromosome 8 when you deplete CDCF, those loop domains start to disappear. And then when you recover it, they are again back. Okay. So what they concluded from the paper here, uh, and besides that, they also uh, looked at if this causes any changes in the transcription genome, right? Because the, this, the change that they observe here, although I'm showing only for one chromosome, it's seen for all chromosomes. Okay. So they looked at transcription. So you can, you can isolate, you can take the RNA from the cells and sequence it and see whether any, any, there is any dysregulation, whether there are genes which are getting upregulated or which are getting downregulated. And uh, uh, the take home from this here is that they found some 4,000 or 5,000 genes which were dysregulated, either upregulated or downregulated, okay? And so this is the control condition uh, where the expression profile should look like this. And this is upon the CTCF depletion. And after recovery, it again goes back to the control profile. So basically, this tells you that this loop domain architecture is important also for governing transcription. Okay. So the conclusion from the paper is that when you have CTCF, the loop exclusion factor, which is the cohesin, will translocate onto the DNA. And when it encounters the CTCF uh, bound sites, which are shown in blue here, it will stop. And that will give rise to the formation of this kind of a loop domains. Okay. And this loop domains together form the compartments. But when you don't have CDCF, uh, it will keep translocating. It will not stop because there are no blue uh, proteins here. And now this structure will be compacted. It will, uh, it will not be maintained. But there is no effect on the compartmentalization. So this tells you that this structure is dynamic and it is regulated by cohesin and CDCF. But this structure is not regulated by that process. And we still don't really understand how the compartment compartmentalization occurs, uh, except for the phase separation that I mentioned. Uh, other than that, we don't have a lot of idea about how A and B compartments are formed. And now the final step, uh, which is to unload the cohesin, okay, which is uh, governed by a protein called wapl. So it's the same sort of experiments. Now we remove wapl from, wapl from the system, so they knocked out wapl from the cells. And now what you'll see is what one would expect is when you are not able to remove cohesin, it will keep moving and it will keep enlarging these loops. Okay? So that is what you see here. So this is the loop structure in the wild type cells. And these are the contact domains. These are the regions where, uh, where, where the two CTCF uh, bound sites are anchored together and uh, uh, the cohesin stalls. But when you remove this unloader, it will keep going further and you will see the enlargement of this loop domain. So in this paper, they show that uh, this loop domain is around 300 kb in size. However, this is around 500 or 525 kb. So there is up to 200 kb enlargement uh, of the loops that you see. And they also stain the DNA uh, with a protein called uh, SCC1. And you see that this is, this is some kind of a weird structure. Basically, of the en because of the enlargement of the loop domains, uh, the DNA starts to look very weird. and the the DNA folding is not normal here. 
So this is what they conclude. This is in the normal scenario where uh, green is the cohesin and this red and blue are the CTCF found sites. Okay? So when this uh, cohesin binds, it will start excluding the DNA unless it, uh, until it encounters the CTCF bound site where it stalls. And at any of the steps, vocal can actually bind and remove the cohesin and go back to the uh, normal scenario, start the first, first stage. But when you don't have this particular protein, uh, so in wild type you have all different sizes of loops because all of this is regulated at different levels and different chromosomes and different regions. But when you don't have vocal, you see all the loop sizes increase. And that's why you see this kind of a weird structure here and this enlargement here. Uh, so these are the three things uh, 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 which have people have discovered and if you have noticed uh, uh, all of these three studies came out in 2017 that tells you that this is a very very recent uh, area of research and very active area of research uh, uh, people are trying to look at it uh, in various disease cells as well in cancer conditions as well from the perspective of how this entire loop remains and loop extrusion governs a uh, the physiology of the cells and it, it is remarkable in the way it explains uh, the functionality of a nucleus okay. and this is the reason i said that maybe sooner uh, the textbooks would need to be rewritten now i'll just give you a two uh, case studies for this uh, uh, on some things that i've worked on in my phd and uh, on another thing uh, on something which i'm working on in my uh, in fred's lab uh, as a postdoc so uh, one of the things that I've worked on in my PhD is X chromosome inactivation. So I'll just give you a brief introduction uh, 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 towards for X chromosome inactivation. Uh, it basically is a, is a dosage compensation mechanism. Uh, it evolved to correct for the gene dosage imbalance between males and females uh, uh, in mammals. And why, why, why is there a gene dosage imbalance is because uh, this is the X chromosome and this is the Y chromosome. So the X chromosome has like thousands of genes on it. Uh, the Y chromosome has just few hundred genes on that. So since females would have two copies of X chromosome, that makes it thousand plus thousand, two thousand approximately. And uh, the males would have uh, uh, one X chromosome and one teeny tiny Y chromosome. Uh, they, they, they don't have the same number of genes as, we, as females do. So in order to compensate for that, one of the X chromosomes in the females, in mammals, is basically inactivated so that it's there in the nucleus, but it doesn't uh, do any function by and large. And this is also a very excellent example to tell you that in the same nuclear space, the, 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 the two chromosomes which are alike are treated differently and how genome folding there is different. Okay, So this is what I told you that when uh, after the evolution of X and Y chromosomes, so uh, uh, there was another there was another non-coding RNA that came uh, that evolved along, uh, which is called XIST. Uh, it's uh, you don't have to remember that, uh, which led to evolution of random X chromosome inactivation, meaning uh, either the paternal copy of the X chromosome or the maternal copy of the X chromosome can undergo inactivation, and that is seen very clearly from this uh, tortoise shell cats. So the coat color here is very patchy uh, because the coat color is an X-linked gene. So depending on the areas where paternal uh, uh, chromosome is active or the maternal chromosome is active, you will see this patchy uh, pattern. Okay. So uh, just to give some historical perspective uh, on that, uh, I'm sure uh, a lot of you in your schools or even in colleges will have done this test called bar body test, where you take uh, your cheek cells and stain it with uh, a DNA dye and see uh, only only the female cells you will see uh, uh, this kind of a blob, which is called bar body. So this was first discovered in 1942, I think. And this, like, it's way before even the DNA was discovered. DNA, DNA was uh, uh, discovered in 1953. Uh, the structure of the DNA was discovered in 1953. So this was discovered by uh, bar, and that's why it's called the bar body. So this is seen only in the female uh, uh, cells. Uh, they, for some reason, were using cat cells, cat neuronal cells for the experiment. Uh, then after a few years, uh, because there was war, and uh, what wars do is they, uh, there's, like necessity is the mother of invention, basically. So uh, what uh, the governments would uh, wanted to do was to understand the effects of radiation on physiology because the atomic bombs were used uh, 
uh, uh, around th at, at that time and there was a lot of chemical uh, uh, arsenal as well so there was a lot of uh, interest and funding towards this sort of a research so mary lyon there when she was in i think university of oxford or university of cambridge then in 1953 uh, uh, sorry 1951 uh, she was looking at a lot of uh, this uh, Newton cats, uh, uh, Newton mice, uh, and uh, she identified a lot of coat color mutations in different mice, and she found a pattern uh, which was different in both male and females. And she thought about it, of course, and then she came up with the unified concept of X chromosome inactivation. Okay, so this was also before we the DNA structure was uh, revealed. This was in 1951. So it was also called uh, the X chromosome inactivation is also known as lionization sometimes. In a nutshell, what happens is you have two X chromosomes in a cell, which are both active at some point during embryonic development. Then as the development proceeds, there is there is this RNA that is made from one of the X chromosomes. Okay. So this is a this is this this RNA does not translate to protein, it stays in the nucleus. So it's called long non-coding RNA. So it's made from one of the X chromosomes, which is now called as future XI, which is the future inactive X. So this is the initiation phase of the process. Then comes the establishment phase. So once it is upregulated, it has to tether to this DNA and start coating it in cis. So basically, it should not diffuse away to bind the other chromosome. It should stay here and just coat this particular chromosome. Followed by there are a lot of other changes that happen, like RNA polymerase is removed from that region. Uh, there are a lot of histone modifications uh, which are repressive in nature, which leads to condensation of the entire chromosome. And then there are further changes which leads to silencing of the chromosome and this is maintained throughout the life of an organism okay. so in simplistic terms uh, this is where you start uh, both the x chromosomes look alike but then one starts uh, making this weird thing and it starts looking different and of course it thinks that it will get the superpower but then eventually what ends up happening like sometimes all of us do is the existential crisis because this chromosome is there in the nucleus, which is actually jobless, it's not doing anything. And this is the only chromosome that's doing all the work, or only X chromosome that's doing all the work. Okay. So coming back to the 3D architecture here, so I was talking about the genome-wide thing. Now we're just looking at just one particular chromosome, okay, and how the entire process of X chromosome inactivation, which I just described, uh, uh, the changes happening on one X chromosome in terms of uh, uh, the RNA coating the chromosome and the heterochromatic marks being laid out, how is that all governed by the 3D architecture, okay? So to test that, there are two sorts of models here, okay? So th this non-coding RNA has to coat the chromosome, okay? So either it can coat the chromosome based on the affinity, so depending on if, if there are certain stretches of the DNA uh, which has more affinity towards this RNA. So this RNA is complementary to those, uh, it's not really complementary, it basically coats, so if it has more affinity, it will go and bind to those sites first. Or second model is proximity transfer. So if the if the DNA is folded like this, so depending on in 3D space, what region is close uh, would be coated first. So they 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 did one experiment where they again cross-link the cells so that you are freezing everything in time and space. You make this growth. Okay. So this is the target RNA sequence. So in this case, it is the exist RNA you make the DNA probes which are complementary to this and you tag it with biotin. Okay. So now wherever this RNA is there uh, coated on the DNA, this probe will go and bind. Okay. Then you, uh, after hybridization, you do all of these tests and then finally you sequence it. So you sequence it at different time points. So you would know basically where, what regions were uh, actually bound first. So whether they were in close physical proximity in terms of linear distance or whether they were in terms of physical proximity in terms of the 3D distance. And that's what they did. And what they found is uh, the, the spreading of this RNA and the subsequent changes that happen actually are governed by this kind of the loop domains. Okay, so this, this shown in red here are the RNA molecules and shown in black here is the DNA, which are all this intricate loops that you see. So. This is the active X chromosome where uh, these domains are not established and so it's not able to coat. And this is the inactive, no, sorry, I'm wrong. Yeah, it's an active X chromosome, yeah. Uh, but the exist RNA molecule is not, uh, uh, 
enough and then once it starts making enough of it so all this red structure that you see here is all all so many rna molecules some 2000 rna molecules are made it will start coating in 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 this in uh, in terms of proximity transfer okay so yeah and the second thing uh, as an example that i would like to give is another fascinating phenomenon called antibody diversification and uh, I'm sure you all must have read about it at some point. Uh, I don't know if people still follow QB or uh, uh, Royt or I don't know what other in, you know, textbooks uh, where they talk about uh, VDJ rearrangement. So antibody generation is a very unique, unique phenomenon. And the, the genes that give rise to antibodies, actually, you cannot call it a gene. So there are different gene segments, rather. So there are V gene segments, there are D gene segments, and J gene segments. And all of this would uh, join to each other in, a, in, a, in, in many permutation and combinations. Uh, and it can technically give rise to 3 to 10 to power 11 possible combinations. And that's why we have this huge antibody diversity, uh, which is, of course, important for uh, uh, fighting a lot of infections. So each, this happens in uh, B cells, uh, which are made in the bone marrow. Uh, so each B cell will have a unique antibody molecule on its surface. This, of course, undergoes a lot of selection process, but that's not uh, uh, the topic for the talk today. So now, first, what happens is D to J rearrangement. Okay? So one of the D, D element here, there are some 10 to 13 D gene segments and four J's, J segments. So they would first join. D stands for diversity and J stands for joining. So they would first join. Once this happens, now this B gene segments, which are also called as variable gene segments, any of this, there are hundreds of, uh, there are 200 variable gene segments, any of this can join. So the question here becomes, why, why isn't always the first one joined? Okay? So again, the research from the lab that I am in currently has shown that uh, this is not organized in a very linear manner like this. Uh, it, it is again uh, organized in a loop domains manner. And the cohesive uh, mediated loop extrusion process, uh, which I just described uh, uh, in detail, basically that would govern. So depending on how far the cohesin can reach and where it encounters the blocking factor, whether it encounters it here, 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 or here, it can basically uh, use all of this variable gene uh, uh, segments and give rise to this humongous uh, 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 diversity. So these are just the two case studies that I wanted to talk about today. Uh, I'll be uh, happy to elaborate upon them if anyone has any specific questions. Uh, I did not go too much into data here because I just wanted to uh, give you the message that how the, the domain architecture of the 3D genome is important in governing all of these processes. Uh, they are important for governing replication, transcription, DNA repair, and all sorts of things. So I will just summarize here uh, by saying that uh, Chromosomal folding helps in achieving the unprecedented levels of DNA compaction. Uh, and it makes it possible, to, uh, even with that level of compaction, that level of higher order genome architecture, it still maintains the functionality uh, for, in terms of all the physiological processes. And uh, finally, it's not only important to study genome folding from the perspective of basic sciences, uh, but it's also helpful because it uh, it, it will also be helpful in understanding many disease conditions, such as uh, cohesinopathies I mentioned. There are laminopathies, uh, progeria where uh, the Huntington, Bilford, uh, uh, progeria syndrome, uh, Amitabh Bachchan in Palm movie has that syndrome. Uh, basically, the lamins there is disrupted, so the nuclear architecture is disrupted. And that's why the DNA uh, 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 packaging is disrupted, or DNA uh, localization and the folding is disrupted, and that gives you or the disease symptoms where the, uh, where, the, where the child looks older, much, much older than he actually is, okay? Then there are a lot of liquid expansion disorders, such as uh, uh, muscular dystrophy, uh, uh, Frederick ataxia, and a lot of things where uh, small stretches of DNA can undergo repeat, uh, 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 small stretches or small repeats of DNA can undergo expansion up to 200 to 300 repeats. And now people have shown that those repeat expansion are basically uh, localized at the boundary where the two tads would meet. So there is a lot of tension at that boundary element uh, because there is a lot of loop extrusion going on and that creates a lot of tension in between. And uh, that leads to, that is one of the mechanisms uh, of repeat expansion. 
uh, cancers, of course, there have been a lot of mutations in cohesin complexes uh, that have been associated in, uh, in cancer uh, conditions, and uh, the list goes on, so on and so forth. And of course, it's important to get some things as well. So, uh, yeah, you have to project it. That's uh, that's also one other thing. Uh, I would like to leave you with this image of the extrusion, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rini, for the wonderful and the enriching talk about chromatin folding. Uh, there are lots of work going in this field. Students can think about taking it up for their research. We will now be taking questions from the viewers. Uh, the first question is uh, from uh, Raj Rajvi Kavar. Uh, he asks a very basic question, why H1 is not cold, called a cold histone? The core is something which actually forms the core around which the DNA is wrapped, and that's why they are called the core histone. So, because H1 binds the intergenic DNA, uh, and a lot of times uh, there could be other linker histones uh, or other histone variants uh, uh, which are bound. Uh, so, it's not a, a mandatory thing. So, that's why it's not called the core histone. Yeah. Uh, the second question is by Kumar Swami. He asks, uh, do chromosomal folding vary between lad and tag? Between lad and tag? Yeah. That's a very, very interesting point. And whoever asks this question should definitely pursue this research. Uh, it's an active, uh, it's, it's ongoing. Uh, it does because uh, lads are actually very AT rich in, uh, in AT gaziness. In terms of that, it's very AT rich and it's. Uh, it, it has a lot of repetitive DNA. So the human genome, uh, as uh, I don't know if we heard Dr. Arpit's talk in the morning, uh, he must have mentioned about how a lot of human genome is repetitive and non-coding. Uh, and we don't really understand the functionality of that. So, uh, and that's why it's also very difficult to map those regions when you're doing sequencing because it's repetitive. So you don't know from which region that sequence is coming from. So, but people have done some some sort of assays where we know that uh, uh, functionality of lads and tads are very different because uh, lads are uh, mostly heterochromatinized, so they are much more condensed uh, compared to tads, which are literally more interactive uh, with each other. Yeah, among as in within each other. Yeah. The uh, next question is from Nishi Mehta. Uh, the question is, does the separation of the genome into domains ensure proper gene regulation? Yes, yeah, that's an interesting point and yeah, uh, uh, it does. Uh, and however, I should also mention here that that's a very attractive hypothesis. Of course, it makes sense, right? When you, uh, when you want to have transcriptionally active or inactive regions, you just segregate them and that's how the compartmentalization happens. Uh, the active region is one compartment and the inactive region is one compartment, okay? Uh, uh, but whether uh, the sole purpose of the loop domains is this transcription, uh, is regulating transcription, is still not very clear because the experiments where people removed cohesin, which is important for formation of this loop domains by loop extrusion, they did not really see a lot of change in transcription, okay? Uh, there was a very modest change whereas the genome architecture was perturbed, the, the loop domains were perturbed. So uh, as you have seen, this is just a three-year-old research. So there's a lot of uh, questions still unanswered and that's definitely one of them. We do have some clues, but it's still, a open, it's still an open question, yeah. The, uh, the next question is from Dr. Syed Wajid. He has two questions. The first is, are there any factors or proteins or mutation that change the chromosomal territories? Second is, what is the significance of interchromosomal interaction? Okay, so uh, answering the first question about the uh, 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 mutations or any perturbations in the proteins which would change the chromosomal territories. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, territories, I don't think people have seen that sort of an effect when an entire chromosomal territory is changed. Uh, what people have seen uh, microscopically as well as using such high throughput assays is certain regions of those chromosomes uh, uh, are mislocalized. Say, for instance, if they were supposed to be towards the periphery in control conditions where everything is normal uh, upon any sort of these perturbations, uh, now maybe they are seen to be more uh, uh, towards the center. Uh, in terms of 
the entire chromosome, there are subtle changes. Uh, there is work from uh, Dr. Kundan's lab at ISA Pune again, uh, where it's looked at uh, how the positioning of the chromosome change uh, during cancer progression. And they do show that uh, 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 at least the localization of uh, few chromosomes that they are studying, uh, they do change uh, subtly. Uh, but uh, in terms of the entire chromosomal uh, architecture being changing in, uh, uh, getting changed in the nucleus, mm -hmm. that's still, I'm not sure if that's known. And mm -hmm. answering the second part where, what is the significance of interchromosomal interactions? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's a very interesting uh, uh, question actually. And uh, what all we know is they do happen, of course, uh, uh, but they are very dynamic. And uh, uh, the trans interactions, uh, what is the purpose? We still don't know. Uh, some people have shown that uh, those interactions can basically uh, are, 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 can eventually lead to translocations, uh, chromosomal translocations, uh, which are, uh, uh, which can lead to cancer uh, conditions, depending on what sort of translocations. But in terms of uh, uh, proper functionality in the normal scenario, we still don't uh, understand that. The next question is by Dr. Madhavi. Um, the question is, would massive, uh, sorry, what are the consequences of disrupting genome organization and do such alteration underlie diseases? What are the consequences of disrupting genome organization and do alterate, do such alteration underlie disease? Uh, all of these uh, proteins are altered and somehow the genome architecture is altered and that definitely plays a role in uh, 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 in, in disease progression or manifestation and something which Adit was also talking about in the morning uh, 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 about how you can use uh, the CRISPR technology uh, to target those sites. Of course, he was not talking in terms of uh, uh, the loop extrusion process per se, uh, but yeah, if you're able to identify the, the regions which can be targeted, uh, you can you can you can try to do that. Yes, definitely. Uh, the next question is from Tejeshwi. Uh, the question is how or why is the degradation of cohesin not lethal if knockout is? Because this is a very powerful experiment. This is a very uh, intelligently done experiment, I should say. Uh, uh, when you when you add the drug, say in this case it was auxin, uh, it would start it would degrade the protein within like uh, twenty to thirty minutes. And uh, you uh, you put the cells in those condition only for a day or two, so that is generally tolerated. But embryonic development, if the cohesin components are missing, uh, that's not tolerated. And people have shown, in fact, even in those experiments, uh, 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 th that was done in a cancer cell line. But if you do that in mouse embryonic stem cells, for instance, or uh, and if you if you if you put uh, prolong the treatment for too long, keep the cohesin depleted for too long, they will they will die. Yeah. Um, cohesin is required for DNA replication because it brings a sister chromatic cohesion, right? So I did not talk about that, but uh, that's like well-documented role of cohesin. So if you don't have that, the cell cycle would not happen. So metaphase mitosis cannot happen basically. So that's why it's easy. The next question is from Apeksha. Um, the question is, a part of X chromosome in female is inactivated to compensate for the small size of the Y chromosome. So if the inactive re region of the X chromosome has a mutant gene, will there be a gene expression and a resulting disorder? So if that gene uh, is inactivated... If the inactive region of the X chromosome has a mutant gene... caused by a mutation in a gene called MECP2, uh, that's an excellent gene. So if, if MECP2 is uh, inactivated, uh, it will that, that gene will not be expressed, okay? But however, so this is actually, uh, most of the excellent genes which have like severe uh, 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 phenotypes are male lethal because they only have one X chromosome copy. But it can be, the disease can manifest in group in females because we have two X chromosome copies, okay? So in some tissues of the cells, uh, my mutant gene is expressed, and in some tissues of the cell, in, in my in some tissues of my body, uh, a normal gene is expressed, 
and the like MECP2 example, it's important for brain function. Okay, so if a protein which is mutant is expressed in say my neuronal cells, which perturbs its function, then of course I will see the disease manifestation and it will affect it because this is a 50% probability. So it's not like just always the one of the X chromosomes is inactive and throughout the body. It can either be a paternal or a maternal X chromosome. So there's a 50% probability. So it's a 50% probability that you will see the disease here. Uh, the next question is from Bala Kumaran. In fact, there are three parts to this question. The, part, the first part is, are transposomes and loop domains related? Second part is, can we use loop domain as markers for identifying transposomes? And in a way, could we study evolution and prevent chromosomal aberration by using cohesive? Are transposomes and loop domain related? That's the first question. Um, so that way everything is related. What I said, loop domain is basically how DNA is organized. So uh, transposome is DNA. So yeah, it can be, it will be definitely organized as a loop domain uh, or it can, most of the transposomes are actually inactivated uh, or not inactivated, uh, sort of repressed during development so that they don't go around, uh, don't go jumping around in the genome and uh, uh, cause mutations elsewhere. So they are basically silenced. So most of those transposome, uh, transposable elements actually uh, are are associated with the lamina, which are the lamina associated domains where the repeats are also localized. Okay, so they are part of a D compartment, of course. Uh, uh, and uh, if if we can, the, in terms of evolution, uh, so it, it's remarkable that uh, uh, that the chromosomal territories. Uh, if you compare the chromosomal territories between mouse and human. So if when you compare the chromosomes, there are a lot of centenic regions between mouse and human and even in other uh, mammals or primates. So if you look at the chromosomal territories, they also occupy the uh, identical positions in individual nuclei. And when you talk about TADS, the loop domains, the topologically associated domains, they are also to a large extent conserved between say mouse and human. Okay. And they are also seen in uh, bacteria. It's been recently shown in colobacter. I'm not saying that they are conserved between colobacter and uh, human. Of course, they just have one chromosome uh, or three chromosomes. I don't remember. Uh, but uh, I don't know how uh, you can. So people have tried to uh, look at uh, if you can uh, play around with the domain architecture uh, and uh, uh, or the proteins that govern the domain architecture uh, as a as a as a potential cure or a therapy for the disease. And that was something what what they were also trying to allude to probably uh, like you know the cohesin components are important you know which components are important you can now try to uh, play around with those proteins or uh, uh, correct correct for those mutations if those proteins have any mutations uh, using gen uh, crispr cas 9 uh, methodology and yes you can try to uh, use that as a therapeutic approach in terms of preventing the uh, chromosomal aberrations so uh, uh, i'm not really sure as of now uh, People tend to think uh, uh, they are also trying to propose and work towards how the chromosomal translocations, like my lab here is currently doing that. How uh, if you if you remove the cohesin from the cells, uh, and then uh, uh, how does the DNA rep repair get affected? And uh, so far we just have very preliminary uh, understanding of that. So yeah, that's an ongoing area. Uh, due to time uh, constraint, we will take up another one question. The remaining question will be made to Dr. Rini and she can reply back according to her convenience. Um, the last question that I'm taking is, what determines that RNA binds to only that X chromosome, which ultimately becomes the bar body and not to the other X chromosome? The question is asked by Lina RNA, first of all, this exist RNA is very huge. It's around uh, 17 kb in the case of uh, mice and 23 kb in the case of humans. So it's not easily diffused away, of course, uh, because nucleus is a very gel-like structure. Uh, so it's not, it cannot easily diffuse away. Besides that, there are proteins that basically bind this RNA as well as the DNA, uh, that is the X chromosome and DNA. So they keep it tethered there. 
they keep it stuck there so that it cannot diffuse away so that's why you see that uh, in the last slide one of my last slides i showed that there is this huge red compartment where uh, there's a lot of uh, some 2000 excess trirena molecules they all stay there they don't really go away and that's how it prevents uh, inactivating both the chromosomes at the same time uh, we will stop uh, with the question and answer session now um, thank you once again dr rini for the enriching talk um, a reminder once more to the participants the feedback link is posted in the chat box of Google Meet and description box of YouTube. Please fill in the feedback form to avail your certificate. The link will be active only for this night. I now call upon Ms. Shalmali Kamar, Faculty, Department of Microbiology, St. Joseph College, and convener of this lecture series, provided for free to do the board of Yes. Shalmali now. Shalmali, can you unmute yourself? Okay. okay. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Rini. That was a, a very interesting uh, talk. We thoroughly enjoyed your presentation. And um, I would like to end with a vote of thanks. So good evening from us to everyone present here today. Uh, to make an event a success, great deal of efforts and planning go into it. An event would be incomplete without acknowledging, thanking, and congratulating everyone who have been the part of the process. So I would like to begin my vote of thanks with firstly thanking the management for always giving us encouragement and full support for organizing these events. Uh, their trust in us gives us the inspiration to go ahead. I want to express our deep gratitude to our principal, Reverend Father Dr. Victor Lobo, for his constant support and backing. I thank our Vice Principal, Dr. W. Jyoti, for being ever encouraging and positive. A big thank you to our HOD, Dr. Beatrice Sequeira, for giving her full support, valuable advice, and encouragement throughout the planning and execution of this event. I extend my gratefulness to all our distinguished speakers for accepting our invitation and giving the most wonderful and fruitful time with their enlightening talks. I express my deep gratitude to my colleagues, Dr. Sayed Bajid, Dr. Vanita NM, Ms. Riya Saha, and Dr. Papi Datta for an impeccable job of moderating the session so very efficiently. A special thanks to Ms. Riya Saha, who has unequivocally been an equal partner in the entire process of planning and execution of this event. I would take this opportunity to thank all the wonderful participants over the period of last three days for actively participating in the international webinar and asking very stimulating and thought-provoking questions. They have thoroughly enjoyed. Finally, and most importantly, I profusely thank our entire student team who have worked tirelessly for uh, last 15 odd days and uh, from learning to and, and from learning to mastering the different softwares and platforms which are required to run this whole show uh, i take this opportunity to personally acknowledge all of them starting with miss jennifer for handling the google meet platform session invitations designing the poster and related forms and uh, um, and on the whole, uh, overseeing the entire planning. Thank you to Larissa for designing and managing the certificates, feedback forms, projection slides, uh, Amal, Shankar, and Samson for managing the online streaming platforms, Aisha, Madiha, Nishi, and Samya for collating the questions coming from all of you participants from different platforms and covering the event as well. 
uh, Vaishnavi and Spurti for val volunteering enthusiastically to participate in this uh, webinar. Thanks to everyone for leaving no stone unturned and playing an important role in making this event a huge success. We hope you will continue to contribute in the upcoming events of the department as well. Lastly, I would like to thank the Almighty for giving us the strength and fortitude to do our bit and letting our efforts bear fruits. Thank you to one and all and wishing you all a very pleasant evening from the entire team of Department of Microbiology, St. Joseph's College Autonomous, Bangalore. Stay safe, stay healthy. May God bless you all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shalmani. Thank you, Rini.